like to welcome um, everybody to. Um, my name is Kathy Feeback. I'm from Main Point Books. Um, you know, as we sort of pivoted to Zoom events, uh, they've been very entertaining. They've been going well for the bookstore. And we're very happy to be able to do a community event with Radnor Memorial Library, the Baldwin School, um, and, and sort of welcome all of you um, to hear Marissa Porches speak. Uh, just so you know some of the rules of the road, everybody is coming in muted. Uh, we ask that you stay that way until Marissa's done speaking. And then at that time, you can certainly ask questions in the chat throughout when they come up and I will, um, I'll ask them at the end. Or you can raise your hand and I'll ask you to unmute and you can ask Marissa directly your question um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, she will be speaking for about 20 to 30 minutes. and. Um, and then after that will be the Q&A. If you want a signed personalized book, um, you can order it through the, my website at www.mainpointbooks. And um, at the end, you'll see a comment section and you can certainly say if you want it personalized to you in any way. She'll be doing that later this week. Um, anyway, I'm very excited also to introduce Pat Weiser, who uh, will tell you a little bit about Marissa. Hi, Pat. Hello, everyone. Um, Hi, Pat. I'm very excited to be with you tonight to introduce a wonderful woman. Um, I am currently the chair of the Board of Trustees at the Baldwin School. I'm also the mother of two daughters, uh, two students at the Baldwin School, ninth and 11th graders. Um, our guest speaker tonight is our current head of school of the Baldwin School. And I have to tell you, when she came to the school, I couldn't have been more excited. Um, all of the parents, really. Uh, her background is incredible, and she provides such leadership to our girls, such um, such a role model for the girls, what they can do in life, um, day to day on Baldwin's campus. And with this book, she's taken that one step further and and provided kind of what she's what she's learned as a Baldwin student and how it's gotten her through life, through her Ivy League education, flying Navy jets. Um, becoming a, a expert on counterterrorism and national security, um, her her job at the White House um, as a, a policy advisor. Um, when we heard we were having such a woman come to Baldwin to head our school, we were like, "Whoa!" Really overwhelming, frankly, and and never never more relevant all the experience she's had than than to come to the school now and and to lead us and our girls. Um, this book. Uh, brings you a lot of stories about Marissa and how she uh, found her own voice and things she has learned along the way and, and uh, has put together in this book to, to help the Baldwin girls and all girls um, and parents of girls to help their girls find their voice, find their grit and their confidence. And I couldn't be more happy to uh, introduce her tonight uh, to speak about her book that is now out there on shelves for your purchasing pleasure, uh, Dr. Marissa Porges. Thank you, Pat. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, of course, uh, to Mean Point Books and to the Radnor Memorial Library for co-hosting uh, this event this evening. It is fabulous to see um, so many people, as we said initially, from around the world. Um, it is the silver lining of doing a book launch in a pandemic is that these moments, um, for those what, whatever time of day or night, we can all get together and have these conversations. Um, I want this to be a conversation. Um, I know particularly for those who had a long day on Zoom um, or a long day behind masks that this, this is a chance to connect um, and really um, you know, have a conversation about gender, about girls, but also about women in leadership, right? I mean, some of us uh, on this call have young women, daughters, granddaughters, nieces in our lives, um, or 575 students uh, at their school. Um, some of us just are thinking our, on ourselves about um, our trajectory as women leaders, our trajectory of how we're mentoring other women in our lives, maybe at work or other places. So to start us off and help with those connections before I'll, I'll talk for a little bit, I'd love to hear from two or three people, what brought you here tonight? Besides the fact that you know me and Baldwin and you're here to support me and I appreciate that too, but either what struck you in the book if you've had a chance to read it yet, or what struck you about the title or the subject that said, you know, I'm going to spend another hour on Zoom and, and talk about um, women, gender, leadership, bias, things that our girls need. So uh, this is, this is I'm, I'm jumping ahead, Kathy, because I know we'll do the Q&A at the end, but just in two or three words, what comes to mind? If folks want to unmute yourselves, you don't have to be on video, um, what comes to mind for the, the subject and why you're here? 
help I'll guide the conversation. Yes, go, Bob. She's very competitive. Uh, sometimes I'm a little concerned. Maybe she's too competitive to always have to always has to win the race and that kind of thing. So as a grandparent, I'm just trying to get some insight as to what young ladies in her age range uh, aspire to and what's healthy and what may be pushing the envelope a bit. Wonderful. So we have some idea about competition for young girls, right? What do uh, people with granddaughters, people with young girls in their lives wondering, is there such a thing as too competitive uh, when it comes to girls? I'll challenge that notion later in the, in the talk, Bob. So thank you for that. Um, I saw a hand raise at the bottom there. Go, Martha. Um, I'm on the call because I've read the book, love the book, and uh, everyone should know that the book is not a series of success stories. The book is also includes examples of when it didn't go so well and what Marissa and what her girls learned from those examples. So I think the book is full of many wonderful uh, stories and very honest stories. So this idea of resilience, right, what that means um, this day and age to, to us as women. Other things, one more thing, anything that comes to mind? Well, before I get started, so we know what you're thinking about. Hi, hi. Uh, my name is Christina. I joined the call tonight because I feel like while I was being raised, I wasn't always uh, raised to be so bold and courageous. And that's something that I'd love to see different in my daughter in her adult life, um, to be able to feel strong enough to speak out and um, confident in herself. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that's, uh, I appreciate both the candor and this idea of how we want to prepare the next generation. Um, and I'm going to use that to pivot. So that's, that's a great opening because the reality is while we think we've come so far and we have, right, we've come so far over the past, you know, 50 plus years, um, just celebrating obviously a hundredth year of uh, a right to vote. And then we think, oh, well, we've had title nine, we've had um, other legislative fixes. We've also had these moments like the last uh, election where we think there's such, you know, we're reaching the era of gender parity. And then we look at the numbers and we look at the data and we realize, wait a minute, there's actually a tremendous ways to go. Despite the fact that the last election, um, more women were elected to uh, political positions than ever before, still less than 25% of all congressional positions are held by women, despite the fact that 51% of uh, people in the United States are female. Um, you look at C-suite executives. Uh, to this day, fewer than 5% of CEOs at Fortune 500 countries are women even though we hear time and again from the next generation of leaders that they want those positions. So then the question is, well, what's happening? Um, is there something going wrong in the pipeline? Is there something going wrong in how we're raising our girls? I would suggest there's nothing going wrong, but there's lots of little things coming into play, little biases, little systemic things that we're working to fix, but also skills and traits and ways of being that we need to teach our girls. And that's what we'll talk about tonight. Things like raising your voice, Things like how to not just take a seat at a table, but own a seat in the room, be part of a conversation. Um, you'll be hopefully horrified as I was to hear um, that even at the Supreme Court, women are talked over by the men in the room. The three Supreme Court justices, including um, Justice Ginsburg, who just passed, uh, in 2016, there was a study done of how often the justices were interrupted. Statistically speaking, those three women at the top, Sotomayor, um, Justice Gingberg, and a Kagan, Elena Kagan, excuse me, um, were interrupted, statistically speaking, vastly more than any of the male justices, including by junior counsel. Junior counsel who, by mandate, are not allowed, in fact, to even interrupt a Supreme Court justice and still did because there's a norm at play. There's things going on here that our girls to this day will still have to face. Um, and we see it every day at Baldwin in terms of how we talk to our girls, how we think about them, um, imagining their world, right? They imagine boundless opportunities, but we need to make sure we're preparing them for that, that what's to come. And that's where this book comes in. So the idea for um, what girls need, so there's a pile behind me, there's one in, uh, in Kathy's window, there's one right here, right? So go pick them up. But um, the idea for what girls need, um, the inspiration came from the girls I see every day. As uh, Martha mentioned earlier, it came from my own stories that sort of were swirling in the back of my head. But the true inspiration for the book came from conversations I was having with our seniors, the girls who are just about to head off to college, you know, had spent whether it was four years or 14 years here at Baldwin, learning how to speak up, speak out, imagine boundless opportunities. 
But when it came to thinking about what's next, they still had those same questions that I had when I was their age. The same questions I had when I was in my 20s. Questions like, well, what happens if you feel like you're being shut down around a room? What happens when I have to negotiate? How do I navigate these moments that you read about still on the front page of the paper every day? And it wasn't that they doubted themselves. They're confident to the core. Um, it's one of the things I love about being here. But there's these real world moments that they wanted to hear about. And before long, I started telling stories, telling stories like the ones in the book and looking at research and social, social science research about gender norms that are still at play um, when kids are young and when women grow up and are in, entering the workforce in the wider world. And it's things like ideas around competition. The idea that women compete naturally less than men. Hmm, what do we think about that? This is where Bob's idea for his granddaughter comes in. And it's idea that I researched for the book because one of the girls I interviewed for the book had just that problem. She was at a spelling bee that, uh, in fourth grade and she got to the end, no, excuse me, a geography bee and she got to the semifinals. And before she knew it, she had a question that she knew she could answer because her parents every summer took her to historical sites and battlegrounds because that's what her dad loved. And so she knew all about um, those battlegrounds. And when she was asked about a Virginia battleground, she knew the answer but she looked around on stage and saw her friends. And she thought, wait a minute, I don't wanna make them feel bad. I don't want them to think I'm competitive. And she said the wrong answer on purpose. She tanked the geography bee. She said, eh, it doesn't matter. I know the answer, but it, I would rather see them win. That's the kind thing to do as a friend. She didn't have that spunk maybe that Bob, your granddaughter, might, you might be seeing in that competitive, oh, no, I really want to win. It's okay. It's okay to win. And years later, two years later, when I asked her about it, she said, no, it's okay. That's my brother is competitive. I don't need to be competitive. That's something for the boys. Her mother who was listening on, who was a competitive athlete in college was aghast and asked her, why is that? And she said, ah, I don't want them to, make, to, be, to be made to feel uncomfortable. I don't want my friends to feel sad. Girls aren't supposed to be competitive like that. And yet, do we see this statistically play out all across the board? Girls are more likely, twice as more likely than boys to opt out of competitive sports by middle school. When peer pressure, social norms start to set in, this idea of what our friends think. And so they say, you know what? I'm not going to compete. It's okay, it doesn't matter. And yet when you look at research that shows who reaches C-suite levels in executive positions in corporate businesses and in law industry and in financial sector, over 90% were competitive athletes in high school or college. That number goes up to 94% when you look at those small number of women who are in mid-level or senior level management positions uh, in the corporate industry. And when you ask them why, when you ask, not even in the corporate industry, when you ask, um, Condoleezza Rice, National Security Advisor. When you ask Christine Lagarde, the current head of the European Union Central Bank, they were both competitive athletes in college. And when you ask them, well, how did it make a difference? And they said, it's because I learned about resilience. I learned about the ability to do my best. I learned what it was like to want to win and be okay with losing. Again, research that has played out for years. One of the first social science studies on competition dates back to the 19th century. A man called Triplett, a professor who used to be a science teacher in high school. And he was one of the first social scientists to do what's called a natural lab experiment, to get kids together and adults together and test competition, test the competitive spirit. And he demonstrated that for both boys and girls, men and women, you perform better if you're competing against someone. If you're running against someone, you just run faster. You're inspired to push yourself. Even if you don't win, you do your personal best. Didn't matter for young people, old people, boys or girls, you do better when you're inspired to compete. And now we bring it back to this idea that Bob was talking about with his granddaughters. This idea that I heard from Chloe, one of the girls I interviewed for the book when she was there for the geography bee. And we ask ourselves, if we let the social norm that we see playing out every day on the field and plays out um, later on in the boardroom too, continue to be a norm. If we let girls think, nah, competition's for boys, not for girls. 
what do we have them lose out on? Do we let them not be their best? Do we not let them own their personal best? Do we not let them think it's okay to win, even if it's okay to lose? Right? And so this is where I would challenge us, and I would challenge you, Bob, to embrace your granddaughter's competitive spirit. And for the moms in the room to say, hey, how are those little ways I can help my girl be competitive in a healthy way? Not maladaptively, not win at all costs, not cheat to win, but to say, no, I think it's okay to want to be my best, whether it's on a sports field or in the geography bee or at the poetry contest at the local library, which I know our libraries in the area have. Because it's not about one way to do it, it's about all these little ways. And that's what this book is about, right? So this book has stories about competition in the social science and how we can help our girls embrace that side of them in a healthy way. It also has stories about um, other things that are our girls competitive, rather their natural advantages, right? Because one thing that came out, comes up when I see, when I walk the halls of Baldwin or when I um, walk around campus and when I think back to my own stories is how things that came naturally to me as a woman were my advantage, whether it was in the Navy flying jets, whether it was in Afghanistan um, or Yemen talking with Taliban and Al Qaeda and doing interviews about counterterrorism, or whether it was around the table at the White House. Moments where I leaned on things that were, came natural to me. Things about how I communicate. Things about how I empathize. Things about how I naturally adapt, naturally multitask. Things that are, by and large, as a generalization, but social science studies prove it to be prove, true, things that come naturally to girls from a young age. And if we nurture it in them, that will be even more so their competitive advantage moving forward. So I will end this portion of our conversation before we open it to questions with a reading on just that. A story about a moment for me, and this one comes from my time flying jets for the Navy, when this idea of my natural advantage, things that came easily to me in terms of how I uh, communicate, relate to other people, develop teams, and as it turns out, problem solving groups um, helped me solve what ended up being a pretty important problem um, uh, that you'll hear about in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So bear with me while I share with you um, part of a chapter um, from the book. The sky was pitch black as our jet circled over the Western Pacific, hundreds of miles from dry land. We were totally alone, except for the lumbering Air Force KC-135 tanker looming a quarter of a mile in front of us, from which we planned to unload 10,000 gallons of fuel to continue our mission. The neon green glow from my night vision goggles magnified the intensity of the small lights on the tanker's drogue. A basket-like device dangling at the end of a long hose unfurled from the back of the tanker. This is how we would pump fuel into our jet. We were trying to dock what, with what looked like an alien mothership. Noodle, my pilot, swiftly slowed our jet to about 300 knots or 350 miles per hour until we hovered a stone's throw behind the refueling tanker. He inched the nose of our jet closer to the other airplane, aiming to fit the fuel probe at the tip of our jet into the drogue, which bobbed and weaved in the night air. For the next five minutes, he painstakingly moved our plane back and forth, trying to firmly lock onto the tanker so we could refuel. Kate, the third aviator in our jet, was calmly calling out numbers on the internal intercom, checking our airspeed and the distance to the tanker in front of us to make sure our two planes didn't collide. The radios were silent. No one from the KC-135 would interrupt right now while we were in the midst of one of the more difficult portions of mid-air refueling. Indeed, one of the more stressful parts of any naval aviation mission. As a second navigator in the jet, I grew more nervous as the minutes ticked by. It felt like hours, and I still hadn't heard our pilots calming. Fuel transfer underway, chirp across the intercom. Firmly secured in my ejection seat, I glanced into the cockpit and pulled off my night vision goggles, reading the fuel gauges closely. My pulse sped up. I tapped my knuckles against the indicator, hoping that suddenly I see a different number. As if my smack my iPhone to get the screen to unstick work trick worked in a military jet at 30,000 feet in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. 
We were low on fuel given how far we were from the carrier. Dangerously low given that there was no land and therefore no airports nearby. If we couldn't refuel from the tanker, what could we do? My earpiece crackled as Kate keyed the jet's internal intercom. Shopper, we're not taking on fuel, she said, using my call sign and showing a hint of the nervous energy that had, I'd already feel creep through the cockpit. We'll try one more time, but I don't think it's gonna happen. Kate paused, letting her words sink in. We were literally in the middle of the ocean, short on fuel, with no airfield or land in sight, and the aircraft carrier too far away to be much help. What's more, we were three of the most junior airfields in the entire squadron. I'd launched and trapped, that is, taken off and landed from the aircraft carrier just a few dozen times. Kate and Noodle didn't have more experience than I did. This mission was starting to feel like sending a middle school softball team to the World Series without a chaperone. Mustering her courage, Kate said, I'll work with Noodle to see if there's a problem with the refueling probe we can fix in flight, but we need to start working on a backup plan. Her suggestion hugged in the cockpit. There weren't many good backup plans at the moment. I'll start running the numbers on our bingo fuel and see if there's any nearby airfield we overlooked, I replied, king my mic while simultaneously pulling from my flight suit cockpit the laminated manual that had instructions for the hundred plus emergencies that could happen while flying. Every aviator spends countless hours reviewing this book and its crisis scenarios with the haunting advice of our flight instructors in mind. We learned how to deal with what's called bingo fuel, which is naval aviation slang for the perilous situation when your jet is critically low on fuel. Technically, it means that you should head to the nearest land-based airport to ensure a safe landing, unless, like us that night, there was no land in sight. Our, our instructors also teach us that emergency protocols are written in the blood of fellow aviators who have lived and died in the situation the manual describes. Both these lessons were front of mind that night in the jet. With a pocket-sized book in one hand, a map in the other, and a notepad strapped to my thigh, I flipped through the, system, flipped through the systematically organized manual, quickly thumbing past emergencies like engine failure, electronic hydraulic failure, and fire ejection to the pages that helped calculate how far we could fly on the remaining fuel we had in the plane. I silently hoped that there was some miraculous place near enough to vert even if it was just an open field. In emergencies, it was always better to touch down on land if possible, rather than trying one of the most difficult feats in the world. Landing on an aircraft carrier in the dark of a stormy night in the middle of the ocean with no extra fuel for a cushion if you didn't catch the wire. I checked and double checked before keying the internal intercom, then selected the setting that ensured our pilot noodle couldn't hear me. It was important for him to stay focused on keeping our jet aloft out of harm's way, Kate and I would figure out what to do next. The rest of the chapter tells what happens next as Kate and I, one of the few other women in my squadron, one of the few other women in the air wing, there was eight of us aviators out of about 200 who flew, four of us who flew jets, myself and Kate being two of those four, she happened to be my roommate as well. We happened to have known each other in flight school. We happened to have a certain way of relating, a certain way of communicating, a certain way of problem solving. And over the course of the rest of the chapter, which I'll let you read when you pick up the book yourself, you hear how we did it differently than planned. We adjusted in midair in the dark of night, how we interacted with our pilot, how we interacted with the emergency crews on the aircraft carrier, how we figured out what the systems that were failing on the plane were, how we ended up landing in the dark of night. We did it differently because of how we communicate, how we problem solved, how we teamwork, and how we related to each other. And I would argue how we saw the problem and its solutions through a slightly different lens. And that different lens didn't occur to me until recently. It didn't occur to me until I was here at Baldwin and see how the girls problem solve together every day in very different ways than I ever saw when I was in Afghanistan working alongside mostly male soldiers. When I was in the White House, when I was typically one of only, if not the only woman at a table talking about cybersecurity. 
when I was in academia, where there too, I was often the only one talking about at a table with mostly men talking about Syria, Al Qaeda, ISIS. And what interestingly plays out and what research shows to be true is that women problem solve differently. We think about things differently because we're taught from an early age, it's social norms, it's a little bit of gender bias, it's how we relate to our peers, our family, our friends, our schoolmates. We're taught to empathize differently. We're taught to take perspectives differently. We build consensus differently. And so it's why, while I was amazed, I wasn't surprised when I read a study that came out two years ago from the OECD, the Office of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, who did a study of 125,000 students around the world, 15-year-old boys and girls, and they tested their problem-solving skills. Four years ago, they had tested how they solve problems individually. They gave them problems and they said, figure out a solution, how quick and how effective are you? Turns out, statistically speaking, boys outperform girls. But then two years ago, when they changed the nature of the problem and they demanded that the problems be solved in teams, that it was not about solving it on your own, but instead about solving it with other people, finding consensus, finding effective middle grounds, 15 year old girls when it was normalized for what training they had, what schools they were at, socioeconomic training, first world and third world countries, literally around the world, outperform little, young boys and average 30 points higher and were 1.6 times more likely to be rated top performers in this skill of collaborative problem solving. Now, any woman who's listening realizes that's pretty good. That's great. That's an advantage we want our girls to embrace. But now when I add the overlay of what people are hiring for, what the future workforce and world, what today's world, but even more needs, uh, will, you know, will need over the next 10, 20, 30 years. When I explain, when I tell you that on interviewing uh, headhunters at the world's top rated headhunting search firms, they are studying tests looking for people who can problem solve in teams. Employers are hiring for this skill because they know it drives bottom lines. They know that it makes you better whether you're a for-profit or not-for-profit, whether your customers are global or local, whether you're solving a crisis like climate change or a pandemic. You need to be able to solve problems in teams. You need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to figure out how to build consensus and find middle ground. And so, Alongside competition, which we could argue is something we need to work on with our girls, here is something that comes naturally to our young girls. And there are concrete ways we can nurture it, little things we can do to say, that's what we want to, we want to instill in them the idea that their natural self is the way to do it, the way to be. Things like encouraging team building, things like for the teachers who are listening on, and I see some of Baldwin teachers here, I know you do this already. Right? That it's not just about the lab they're doing or the, the problem they're solving when you take a break in class. It's about how they're working with their partner, how you build moments into the day where they have to practice that. Because it's not easy. It may come naturally, but it needs to be nurtured. For the parents listening in or the grandparents, it's that moment when they get in the car and you don't just ask, hey, how did school do? Or when they mention a problem they're doing in lab or a project they're doing with a friend, you don't just say, how did it turn out? You ask how it worked with their friend. You asked about the moment when it didn't work well and you say, what did you do? Ah, oh, what happened when you guys disagreed? What did you do next? Was it easy? Was it hard? What worked? Those are the questions that reinforce for our girls how important those moments are and help them understand that that's not just what you value, but what they should value too. These are just a few of the ideas in the book. Um, I'm happy to go into more ideas about adaptability, empathy, some of the other uh, key skills that I, our girls um, have and need to nurture. Also ideas like negotiation and building your voice, um, things like how to build that ability to ask for what you need, something that all of us need. Um, because I also think that these are all skills that we as adults, the women who are listening in, can each nurture in ourselves too. And that's one thing that really came out in the book that I think it's not just what, what girls need, it's not just what young women need. I think these are things all women need for 
all of us. Um, and the way we can support each other in getting better at these skills is some candid conversations about when we do it well and when we don't. And so I will end this portion with a nod to Martha's comment earlier, this idea about sharing stories of failure, because that's actually one of the most impactful things we can do for each other, for our girls, for young women, for the, um, those women you work with at work, especially if you're senior and they're junior, but sharing those times when we stumble. And it's not just because, again, go back to the social science, it's not just because social science research shows that lessons of failure stick more, they stand out more. They've done research with emergency first responders. And when those first responders tell lessons of success to their colleagues, they're less likely to make an impact. They're less likely to make a difference the next time that firefighter or EMT um, hits the road in an emergency. But when EMTs, first responders, police and firefighters, soldiers and sailors share moments of something that went wrong, a moment of failure, those are the moments that stick out that later when an emergency comes out that someone in the back of their mind remembers and calls on to do a better job the next time. So whether it's that social science research that shows you or the sheer fact that the most often remembered story that I've told the girls is about my first meeting with the President of the United States. Sitting around the Roosevelt Room, right across from the Oval Office when I was serving under the last administration. Literally at the most pivotal moment in my career, something I'd been working to for years. I was three seats away from President Obama. He had a cold that day, I could tell because he was sucking on a lozenge and drinking out of a little dainty ceramic cup with the presidential seal on it. And we spent the hour talking about national security, foreign policy, counterterrorism, the areas of, that I'd researched, places I'd studied firsthand, places I'd been and visited and trumped and done solo research for years. And over the course of the hour, when talking with the leader of the free world about the most pressing issues on our minds, I didn't say a word. I literally, it was a cliche playing out that the cat got my tongue. And I could remember now thinking about the narrative going in my head. Oh, I'll, I'll answer the next question. I'll ask the next question. The male colleagues in the room, eh, they haven't had their chance yet. I'll let them have it. And I walked out of the room and I'm not sure what happened here, especially as a Baldwin girl, Baldwin woman, spending my entire life and career being raised to raise my voice, raised to earn a seat at the table. And I literally had earned the seat at the table in the world, right? And I think it was just one of those times when I stumbled, when I didn't realize what I needed to do, when I didn't dig into my competitive spirit, when I didn't say, no, I'm going to speak my piece. It doesn't matter if the boys are offended. Let them be offended. I know about Al Qaeda and Yemen and Afghanistan because I was there too. Now, I had the good fortune of being able to spend, have a couple more moments with President Obama and have that moment when, again, the cliche plays out, stuck in the elevator with the leader of the free world and what do you do? Um, and was asked point blank, what would you do, Marissa? He called me Yemen girl by that point. <laughs> what would you do to combat ISIS? And a walk from behind the stage of a speech that I'd written for him or with others for him on an issue that I was working on um, back to his limousine, we had our one-on-one -on -one debate about what to do about ISIS. And I'm fortunate that I had that moment of recovery, but what I don't want to ever have happen is for our girls or the other women listening on today or any of us to have to wait for that moment of recovery. So the book is also about making sure that we nurture in our girls all those skills that they can rely on even as we change the system because the system has to change too. But there are ways that we can help in the interim to make sure we give them the advantage that they need to nurture in their skills and close the gap um, no matter where they head next. So with that in mind and more stories about adaptability and empathy, communication and raising your voice, I'd love to open it up to questions for the last 20 minutes or so. I think that's the fun part in the conversation. May, if I may share a failure. I was Naval Academy class of 63. I failed my last year and I made three carrier landings in good daylight. I am blown away by your experience and I can only salute you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, and I'm sure there's lots of stories like that that we, uh, that we all have 
And I'd love to hear either stories or questions or other things that are on people's minds that we, we figure out in ourselves what to work on or what to nurture for the next generation. Hi, Marissa, it's Christine again. Um, I thank you so much for sharing all your amazing stories and um, I'm looking forward to reading the book. I, I'm curious, um, I have two young children. I have an eight-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son and they are very competitive against one another. And you know, it causes of course a lot of stress because they're at a very young age and they get very upset. Um, and I find myself sometimes saying like, don't be so competitive with one another, like support each other, you know, and I'm just wondering, you know, in those types of instances, you know, I want to encourage her to, to be, you know, competitive and to put herself out there. Um, but, you know, I, I, I see it sort of causing some like stress and butting heads. And, and I'm just wondering, like, how do you recommend working on a situation like that where you, because I see myself stifling and I don't want to do that. Um, but in the same token, you know, um, I don't want her to like kill her little brother. <laughs> well, we do want to uh, avoid uh, little brother aside, isn't that particularly during a pandemic, right? Yeah. We have uh, many yeah. more months of that ahead. Um, so I think there's a couple things to be conscious of, right? And this is where small things make a big difference, right? Small things in our own lives, small things in our girls' and boys' lives, right? Things like, are we sharing the same message to boys and girls, right? So one thing, and this is, again, you don't, it's not about being tough on ourselves and thinking like, ah, oh, I didn't do it right, but just next time we catch ourselves um, trying to uh, back them off of being competitive or back anyone off being competitive, I guess I would question, are we doing the same thing for the boys, right? I realize there's an age difference at play, although I'm sure but clo it'll soon close and, and the younger brother will take to task his older sister. I'm, uh, I'm the youngest of four and I will say that m my brother is just above me and he certainly took my older sisters to task at some point, although I see one of them on here, so I don't know if she would claim the same, same thing at some point. But um, so I think it's one thing about how we balance the messages between boys and girls, right? That they're not hearing that it's okay for one to be competitive and not the other. Um, there's another thing also about finding the appropriate moments to nurture competition, right? And this is where it's like the maladaptive form of competition where it's uh, win at all costs, whether it's always competition, whether it's where, um, where they don't like losing, right? Where they don't understand that losing is part of competing. Right. And so it may be about finding ways to while at home and it's hard right now, particularly when we're finding so many times at home and there's fewer opportunities outside the house. But it's about finding other appropriate moments or other ways where it feels right for your girl and your boy um, to compete outside the home. That could be a local sporting um, event or a team. Right. It could be a soccer game, soccer um, club, excuse me. Um, it could be something. It's unusual. There's actually um, uh, specific board games that are about collaboration, not just competition. One that I actually had to remove from the book right before it went to press um, is called Pandemic. It's literally the girl's favorite. I know you can't, you can't say it now because it's you know, a little bit uh, too close to home, but it's actually a game where they're competing, but they're also collaborating together. And so then they're competing against an external quote unquote enemy, AKA um, in this instance, a pandemic. But there's other ones that are similarly like that. The book has a few of them um, about ways that we can use games that are competitive games, but also nurture problem solving and team, team building or finding other moments. That's one that you could use in the house with your kids, um, but also finding other moments um, so that if the message is don't compete with your brother, it's not don't compete. It's let's find other moments for you to compete. Because I think it's a great, and it just, you know, she'll listen. She sops up everything you're saying, whether or not you realize it. It's not to make a big deal out of the little moments, but it's just to remember that the next time you see something that will suit her, um, a poetry contest, an art contest, a sports contest, say, hey, that sounds like something you'd enjoy. Throw your hat in the ring. Um, it's interesting because that act of throwing your hat in the ring, that's part of the act of competing, which we overlook. Um, and it's one of the most important parts of competing that falls away um, in the gendered way as we get older. It's one of the reasons why to this day, less women are likely to enter political contests than men when they hear the contest is competitive. Statistically speaking, when men are asked, would you run for office and women, 
they are sort of a little, they're on par until you distinct, until you define the political contest as competitive, as you will be right, writing it, not just uncontested, but against someone. Then the men say, eh, it doesn't matter. I'll still throw my hat in the ring. And the women say, maybe not this time. I won't try. And that's what we're trying to diffuse. That's the thing we're trying to build a muscle memory in our little girls, in our young women, in ourselves to say, I'm going to go for it. I would also leave you with the idea of being proud of when we compete. And this is something that came out of that conversation I had with Chloe and her mother about the moments when we as adult women celebrate competition and celebrate ourselves competing. Competing is going for the PTA president's role. Competing is going for a big job. Competing can even be going for um, that next apartment, right? Against somebody else and having to negotiate. And it turned out that Chloe's mom had just gotten a big job, one that she had to compete against other people and go for multiple rounds of interviews, a job that her daughter knew she was going for. But because she had never described it as this moment of competition, of throwing herself her hat in the ring, of having to be judged by peers and being okay if she lost, her daughter hadn't even realized it was a competition. She knew to be proud of her mom for getting the job, but she hadn't thought about it as a, oh, that's kind of like what you have to do when I run for president of my class, right? Or when I throw, uh, put my poetry in for the library poetry contest. Again, these are all just little ways. We don't have to do them all. It's about picking the ones that feel right at a given time, at a given age, and just keeping them in mind because the years are long and there's many chances to reinforce these ideas with our girls. But thank you for asking, Christina. It was great. Thank you. Other things on people's minds. For non-video participants, this is the time to just go ahead and unmute or type a question into the chat box. Uh, Kathy, may I be next? Go for or it. Marissa, yeah. I'll go for it. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And um, I found myself when you were talking about men and women, and we have a lot to learn from one another. And I was thinking about uh, way back when, not that I was there, but the women at the well while the women were there uh, cleaning and washing and talking and sharing, and the men were out fighting and getting food, and sometimes they never returned. And then we all know in biology, it's important to know this for everyone to know, that men do have more testosterone than women. And not that that can hold us back, but I thought of like that time when you were with uh, President Obama. I thought, well, that was your moment where you were in the well, at the well, and maybe it was a biological thing, but then you remembered, I can do this because biology is not our destiny. And you had something kick in, it kicked in, it was there. You learned to tap it because you learned when you were Baldwin a long time ago that it's there, it's within you. And, you know, there is a natural, there's biology for all of us to know and to teach young girls also about that, I think. So what's your opinion on that? Having been yeah. in the oh. Navy with all those men and, you know, probably knowing full well that they had 10 times as much testosterone as you. Yeah, testosterone doesn't win the game, right? So here's the no. thing. I think this it is can get you in trouble. Well, but the testosterone. I, I, I think it's um we don't want to distill it down to uh simply a matter of biology, right? Yeah. Um and I think this is where you know the age-old nurture or nature arguments come into play. Um and I think that uh underestimates so many of the other things that are going on um every single day for, for us and our girls, right? Because I would argue that it was a mindset for me. It was just something that I had forgotten about. Um, this is where I think muscle memory comes in and really helps. Uh, the same muscle memory we use, fight or flight, um, the same muscle memory we use when we're doing public speaking and we get better at it over time. The same muscle memory that means my book talks have gotten better over time and I hope you're enjoying it means that, you know, these are just things we have to practice. So one is we can practice almost anything if we think about it. We can practice how we, we can even practice how we empathize. There's been a lot of recent research that shows empathy can be nurtured, right? Even though studies have shown that when children are very, very young, 
there's interesting that, and it's a little bit disputed, so it's still, you know, uh, it's because it's early research, but that shows from a very early age, it looks like girls are predisposed to be more empathetic than boys. Um, it's in how they communicate, um, how they relate to one another, how they take perspective. And it's something that often gets reinforced, right? It's in how from a very early age, from even before preschool, you have norms being reinforced, right? That um, the sharing of toys, the how we're taking perspective of another person, how we're teaching boys and girls to relate to one another. And yet over time, research has shown that empathy is falling away in the next generation. That college students today are statistically speaking less empathetic than college students 20 years ago. Even as we know that empathy is critical to how we relate to one another, how we function in a, court, in a workplace or at home, how we drive a bottom line when it comes to profit even, right? It's why they've actually begun teaching um, people empathy in major companies, even old traditional ones. Ford Motor Company now teaches their engineers how to be empathetic. Young engineers, when they join Ford Mode Company, Ford, have to don what's called an empathy belly. It's literally a suit that mimics what it feels like to be a third trimester pregnant woman. It has a belly, it constrains your chest. They have to spend time getting in and out of, a, of Ford cars with that empathy belly on to experience what it's like to be one of their pregnant customers so that the engineers can design the cars with those customers in mind. And it's not because Ford is candidly um, so selfless, it's because they understand it makes their engineers better. That by thinking empathetically, they can think they can take the perspective of their customers and do a better job at um, their design and their design thinking. Now we go back to what you were saying earlier about nature, nurture, biology. Um, I would argue there's so many more complicated things going on, right? Because there's something going on in the wider world that is uh, disincentivizing empathy amongst our kids in the next generation, right? It, it's actually not uh, gender specific. Both boys and girls, men and women, when they get to be in a college age, um, gen empathy falls away. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And the other thing to keep in mind, I would argue, is the daily experiences of our young women and our adult women too. I imagine every woman listening on or every husband with a wife or every husband who's taken a close listen to what their um, daughter or niece or um, friend from college who's a woman uh, has complained about or talked about when they come home from work can think of a moment where gender bias or gender dynamics came into play. And it's not necessarily gender harassment like we read on in the front pages of the paper. It could surely be the fact that most women I know take a scarf with them to work, have a sweater under their desk, may carry an extra layer with them when they go into the office. Now we haven't been in offices in a long time, but if you remember what it was like, you may think, hey, that's me. It's actually because, and there's research that has shown that the temperature setting in most office buildings has been sent by historic algorithm that is based on the body temperature of men. And their body temperature runs slightly different and so they prefer, they feel more comfortable when it's slightly cooler. It's the same dynamic at play and there's a whole book on my shelf behind me, Kathy, if you're looking at books, there's one behind me that has all this research that shows this is still going on. It's the same research at play um, that made it uh, the fact that we go back to my time in the Navy. Right, it didn't matter that um, you know, our biologically, we were differently built that my, you know, I was, uh, I'm, it didn't matter inherently that I'm stronger, more uh, leather, I'm less, I'm more petite, shorter, my arm length is different, that there's a lot of sort of maybe biological differences. What mattered was that the equipment I was wearing had been designed with men in mind, right? I actually had to sign a waiver before I flew off carriers for the U.S. Navy to say that if I ejected from my ejection seat, I would not sue the U.S. military if the ejection seat didn't work as well as it should have. Because it had been designed for a man decades before and you know, I was smaller, different proportions, not quite the right weight. It would probably work, but if it didn't, don't worry about it. I was happy to sign that away, sorry mom, who's actually listening tonight, because I was so excited to fly and it didn't really bother me because I would be okay. But 
My point is there are a lot of not just biological or nature and nurture things going on, but there's a lot of systemic underpinnings that are still in the wider world that we don't even realize are happening um, that end up being daily moments for our girls. They could be little, but over time and as they layer on and build up, there are things that we need to be honest with our girls that they'll face and they need to be prepared to deal with no matter where they head next. So slightly different take on the biology part of things, Pam. Um, I think Ricky has a question if she wants to unmute and ask it. Thank you. Go ahead, Ricky. Well, I was just raising my hand because I had that experience about bringing the scarf in and then I forgot how Zoom worked, but I can ask you a question. <laughs> I love you, Marissa. Um, I, so I went to Baldwin. Um, I graduated, I played field hockey with Marissa. So we've known each other for a long time. So I had that experience in my Two younger sisters also went there, um, but I, I find it like I find it so interesting just the the messages that just the, the the messages the girls get at such a young age how to um, even at like second grade when my son's in second grade so I see like second grade girls I see them struggling already in school like in co-ed schools and um, I don't know if you could just talk a little bit about like the all girls school thing. And if that's part of, I mean, I know we can do work on how, what girl, all girls need like at any time, but just that piece of it, why it's unique and helpful. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ricky. And, and speaking to that, I mean, so for those of us who've had an all girls experience, whether it's Baldwin or summer camp or um, an experience in your church or synagogue or mosque or something else, right? Some other moment where you've been surrounded in a particular way um, with, uh, with other girls, other women. Um, it is a unique moment. And I think it's a unique moment in particular um, for how it uh, helps girls practice their voice. Right, and that's actually the starting point for the book, right? For those who've just picked it up, um, you'll see that one of the first chapters is stories about voice. Stories about how we nurture in our young girls the chance to speak up. And it's based on, you know, the story I just told about my time in the White House. Um, it's also based on um, something that I saw when I was here at school a few years ago um, that so incredibly impressed me because it was something that I was both shocked and um, uh, amazed by and incredibly proud of and something that I didn't don't think many girls would be able to do. And that's when um, one of the uh, teenage girls uh, at my school was sexually harassed in um, a public setting. Um, and it was the stuff that candidly happens all the time. Cat calls, body shaming, sort of, but made to feel scared, made to start running, made, called after in a way that um, when she got to her mother's car, um, not yet driving age, her and her friend, um, and they were scared. And, but it's what they did next that so impressed me that I don't think many young teenage girls do because statistically speaking, most college age girls don't, right? The reporting of moments of sexual harassment, the reporting of moments of sexual discrimination, things that we're seeing it play out on the front page of the paper aren't typical because it's hard. It's hard to speak up in an easy moment. It's particularly hard in moments where you're feeling victimized. But what the girls did was they wrote a note um, to the president of that college and explain what happened in a very professional way, in a way that for a teenage girl, I was like shocked and amazed. But then with even more amazing was within 24 hours, they got a response and I said, can you, wanna, can you come talk to us? I, we'd like to know more. And within 24 hours, they were sitting um, with an older um, white male. These uh, both girls were not uh, white themselves. And so there was both a gender dynamic and a race dynamic. Um, the head of security, and the head of HR to talk about what happened. And sure enough, they found on a video exactly what the girls had experienced. And soon enough, um, the, uh, the men uh, who had done the harassing um, were appropriately disciplined. Um, but what the girls wanted to know was in their email, because I, I was actually uh, provided a copy in the conversations that followed was, we'd like to know, do you have sexual harassment training? Because if not, we think you need to do it again. We think there's a conversation here because this is not how young women should be treated. And it's moments like that that speak to this idea of how we teach voice from a young age, because it is something we need to teach early on. And it is something that um, does get nurtured differently in all girls environments. Again, whether it's a play group or a school or a summer camp or an after school program. 
And so it's something that I encourage everyone to find. And even now as an adult to find for yourself, because being surrounded by women does help nurture your voice. Now you think, how is that? Why is that? Well, there's a couple things going on. Um, part of it is, again, how we relate to each other. Part of it is how we um, support one another differently. Um, part of it is this idea that there's no gender norm with speaking out. And it's why when they've studied play groups of elementary students, elementary school students, um, and they've looked at play groups where there's just girls and play groups where there's boys and girls. In that group where you have boys and girls of groups of three or four playing on a playground around age 10, so we're thinking like fourth or fifth grade, if there's both boys and girls, the boys will speak out three times more often than the girls. They will ask questions, they will um, cheer with each other, they will talk with each other um, three times more often. You take that same young girl and you move her to a different part of the playground, you move her to a different room, maybe a different classroom, maybe a different sports team, and surround her with just young girls, she will suddenly speak out at the same rate as that male peer did, that male classmate, the male teammate, the male play date friend did in that other environment. Again, there's a lot going on here, social norms that happen very young, um, things that happen at, at home and schools, other places. Um, but one way that we can combat it um, is finding moments and finding ways where our girls feel comfortable speaking out. And so, Ricky, I do think girl, all girls' environments have been shown to do so. Um, and I do think it's something that for those listening in, um, I think we can find for all of us. Again, it's the, it's the book group, it's the play group, it's the soccer game. It can be a girls' school or a summer camp. Um, not every place has those opportunities. And I think um, we're fortunate to be one that has a few of them. So thank you for asking. I don't know if there's any other questions. I know we're at the top of the hour. I also know um, it's... Uh, it's always a late on a weeknight. If there's any last question, oh, we see one of our young girls right there joining us. Um, but please feel free to email me after or Kathy, if there's any other questions that you came in or people that raised their hand. Um, and I'm just glad to have everyone join us tonight. Thank you so much. This is incredible. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, everyone. Again, you, um, appreciate everyone being here um, and joining us. Uh, look forward to hearing people after you read more stories in the book. So pick up your copy, and I look forward to personalizing it for everyone, too. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you. Baldwin family, Marissa, Ricky, Kathy, everybody. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much.